Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. This is a Nashville webinar measuring physical and behavioral health integration in the context of value-based purchasing. And for the next hour, we'll be uh, very, uh, we're very excited to hear from three speakers today. Uh, so the first is going to be Kitty Purington, a project director here at Nashby and one of the authors of an upcoming issue brief uh, on this topic. Uh, the second, Dr. Harold Pincus, a professor and vice chair in the Department of Psychiatry as well as the co-director of the Irving Institute for Clinical and Translational Research at Columbia University. Dr. Pincus is also the director of the Quality and Outcomes Research at the New York Presbyterian Hospital and a senior scientist at the Rand Corporation. And third, Greg Allen, who is the Director of the Division of Program Development and Management within the Office of Health Insurance Programs at the New York State Department of Health. Following the presentations, we'll open up to Q&A, although as you'll see in this housekeeping slide that um, we do have the opportunity to take questions during the entirety of the presentation. Um, they will be reserved to the end, but please don't feel that you need to wait. Uh, if for whatever reason you have any difficulty with the audio, you can use the numbers on the screen to dial in on your phone. And slides and a recording of today's webinar will be available on Nashby's website within the next few days. Uh, before we begin, I just want to thank the Commonwealth Fund for their support of this work. We could not do this work without them, and both today's webinar and the upcoming issue brief uh, is being done as part of an uh, ongoing project with the Commonwealth Fund uh, supporting states uh, better integrate behavioral and physical health care. Very excited to have everybody on the line today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the speaker's time. And with that, I will move it all uh, over to Katie Parrington. Great. Thanks very much, Charles, and I'm delighted to be on the call today. I'm going to try to be very brief and um, just quickly highlight an upcoming brief from Nashby uh, entitled Measuring Physical and Behavioral Health Integration, a Look at State Approaches in the Context of Value-Based Purchasing. Um, with that brief, my colleague Rachel Yalowicz and I um, looked at what three very different states are doing at the intersection of value-based purchasing and the integration of physical and behavioral health, um, with a particular focus on how states are using measurement in these efforts. And I'm not going to um, talk too much about the specific state activity, partly certainly because um, we have Greg Allen on the line who can speak um, very well about uh, what's going on in New York. Um, but we looked at three states, Alabama, Maine, and New York. And um, we chose these states because in Nashby's work with states across the country, we get a lot of questions um, not only about how to demonstrate broad outcomes of integrated care initiatives, but also kind of the what questions. What does this look like on the ground? How do we know as a state policymaker that integration, integrated care is happening? And so we scanned for states that were working to address both questions um, around are our state investments in integrated care, um, are these things working, and uh, are we seeing providers deliver care differently as a result? And um, also, are we getting broad um, population-based improvements across the populations that are the focus of these initiatives? And so um, folks can also take a look at that slide and also the upcoming brief to, to find out more about what these individual states are doing. But all of these states are, again, working at the payment reform level and also at the de delivery system reform level. So some of the um, key findings that we found as emerging themes across these um, few states, um, one that is that states are really taking a multi-level, multimodal approach to measuring implementation and effectiveness of, of integration. So they're using process and structural measures, for instance, to better understand how their Medicaid or, and or state dollars are being used to, to transform care on the ground. So again, does the provider have care management, um, for instance? Are they using evidence-based standards and protocols? Are they using population-based management tools and HIT or HIE and HIE to um, uh, share information across service sectors and with other providers? Um, and states have a number of different ways that they're looking at this and how they're measuring the actual transformation. But, um, those are some of the process and structural components that, that they may track, uh, again, on the ground. Um, on a broad payment reform level, they are typically using um, 
HEDIS measures and more standardized uh, validated measure sets, um, particularly when they are um, using those measure sets to track value-based payment and they are putting payers at risk for those outcomes. And while specific measures vary, state, um, state value-based purchasing initiatives in particular are including behavioral health measures that are focused, typically focused on a few key conditions. So that may um, depend on the focus of the initiatives. For instance, for mild to moderate population focus, states are typically folding in measures related to uh, depression and substance use disorder for, for sort of the general Medicaid population. Um, for more uh, specific populations with serious mental illness, states um, uh, may include uh, diabetes or metabolic screening, for instance, for people taking antipsychotic uh, uh, medications. And adherence to medication is another common, uh, common measure to include for that SMI population. Um, and then across initiatives, states are also measuring things like care coordination as a key element um, across initiatives. Uh, that involve integrated care. States are also starting to explore the use of measures beyond some of these national measure sets to get at things like social determinants of health, um, housing stability, employment, corrections involvement. Um, but I, I, I think from our discussions with states, um, these kinds of measures and, and states' comfort level with using these kinds of measures and implementing them and certainly tying them to a risk-based payment methodology are, are really at a starting point. Um, there's not a lot of social, or sorry, nationally validated measures that really get at these kinds of, of, um, of themes, but it is something that states are starting to look at and very interested in working with. Um, there's also uh, a growing interest at the state level in identifying and using measures that really more accurately capture things that matter to patients and to providers. So um, you know, especially in the realm of behavioral health, I think there is a growing interest in being able to capture, are people getting better? Um, there's a recognition that many of the measures, measures used for both behavioral health and for physical health are really proxies to get at this question. So states and I think um, working with advocates are, are thinking about ways that they can capture information that gets at, are people improving? So just a few um, key considerations before I turn it back over to Charles. Um, uh, so these are a few considerations that are sort of more about implementation and best practices from some of the state policymakers that we spoke with. Um, so uh, certainly alignment of measures is a key theme and um, one that state policymakers are very aware of when they're creating a measurement approach. Um, particularly for states with value-based purchasing initiatives, it can be uh, of great importance that how states are tracking and measuring Delivery system transformation is also supporting and aligning with the quality measures that are tied to payment um, at the payment reform level. So we're not only alignment sort of in a horizontal way um, so that, for instance, your PCP is not having to deal with 46 different measure sets from various initiatives and payers, but also vertical alignment so that the PCP, again, is working on goals that support um, the uh, risk-bearing entity with whom that practice may be contracting. Um, measuring change and or measuring outcome is another consideration for policymakers, one that I've touched on already briefly and that the paper, our, our brief, um, talks about is, um, is oftentimes uh, something that the states struggle with. And, um, and often, uh, at least in the short run, as infrastructure develops, they will, states will, will likely want to do both, both measure change at the provider level and measure broader population outcomes so that they can um, track whether those critical investments at the provider or network level are having a desired result and that those changes which may be process or structural are also contributing to better outcomes at the population level. And then finally, um, is the data available? Um, certainly there's uh, a lot of the deeper dives that state policymakers would love to be able to make on measuring things like recovery or social determinants of health can really be stymied by the lack of access to good data and data beyond claims or encounter data. And so as states get better at having agile um, 
data systems, agile sort of component-based data systems that can talk to other parts of their state data enterprise um, as we see more agility and standardization in clinical data from um, health uh, information technology. Um, I think we will start to see states take on some of these questions as part of their measurement strategy once they are really able to um, get a handle on some of that kind of data that's not readily accessible to them now. So that, um, in a very quick run through, is uh, a little bit of an overview of an upcoming brief from Nashby. So thanks, and I'll turn it over to Charles. Thank you, Jitty. And as I mentioned, we do anticipate that that brief will be released uh, on Tuesday of next week. Um, so with that, Dr. Pincus, would you like to join? Sure. Uh, glad to join. So I, I also want to thank the Commonwealth Fund. We are in the midst of a project that's funded by Commonwealth to create an agenda for quality measurement at the interface of behavioral health and general health care. And um, so what I'm going to be focusing on is kind of a David Letterman top 10 set of issues that um, um, really are largely at the sort of 30,000 foot level um, to give a sense of what we think are the, some of the most important issues and some initial thinking about some of the work that's coming out of our Commonwealth Fund project. Um, but before I sort of get to the 30,000 foot, I just want to start at ground level because ultimately when we think about quality measurement, it really comes down to uh, really some very personal questions that we need to think about in terms of how do we you know, regular people um, choose a doctor um, for ourselves or our children or our parents. How do we choose a mental health provider um, or suggest one uh, for our family or suggest one for a friend? Um, how do you know whether you're actually receiving good care and good behavioral health care or high quality medical care in general? Um, and then what data do you examine to answer some of these questions? And for the most part, it's disappointing if you look at what data you have to answer these kinds of very personal questions. Um, but to think for a moment about what data do you wish that you had. Um, so, um, which brings us to sort of the first issue um, uh, to, to talk about, which is um, the importance of this interface. And I think that, um, you know, Kitty really, you know, identified some of the key issues. But again, to think about it from an individual point of view, um, to think of a 30, four-year-old man with schizophrenia, diabetes, and tobacco dependence, that person can expect up to a 25-year shortened lifespan and significantly increased medical costs. Or a 25-year-old HIV-positive female IV drug abuser with uh, PTSD. You know, in many cases, you're going to see frequent emergency department visits, non-adherence to her medications, and again, increased medical costs. Or a 60-year-old woman with diabetes, congestive heart failure, and depression and oftentimes you're going to be seeing uh, frequent hospitalizations and rehospitalizations, a lack of self-management and adherence, and uh, somebody who's an early candidate for long-term care. And this is all on top of the, you know, the broader issues at, at the health policy level of the additional costs, which can be as much as 50% higher for people with mental disorders, sort of the whole issue of, of predictive modeling and hotspotting, the, uh, you know, the uh, and recent reports from the Institute of Medicine identifying poor quality for this population that has this kind of comorbidity and the need to incorporate um, specific attention to these issues um, within value-based purchasing. The second issue is to be clear that we need to think about both sides of the interface. A lot of the focus has often been about uh, uh, engaging primary care providers and primary care um, practices with regard to treatment of mild to moderate behavioral health conditions that are common in primary care settings. And that's really important. And for the most part, what we find that they're often not identified or they're treated as acute problems with little follow-up rather than as they should be as kind of chronic illnesses, much like other conditions like diabetes or hypertension. But we also need to think about the reverse of that, which is for people with severe and persistent behavioral health conditions, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, drug dependence um, that are treated largely in behavioral health settings, they have uh, limited access to primary care. Um, and this is a, a pretty significant problem because they often have poor self-care. Um, often their medications might worsen their general medical conditions. Um, and they really don't, uh, are not often welcome in primary care settings. Um, and, and part of the underlying problem is that we have medical and behavioral health providers are really operating in silos. 
And so part of the question is how can sort of measurement strategies and value-based payment strategies try to break down some of those silos and fragmentation. So if you think about it, so just to quickly go over the measurement development process. So there's, there's a relatively limited number of measures that are available in behavioral health care in, in general, but um, in particular at this interface. And there's kind of a broad-based approach to measure development. It starts with um, standardizing practice elements. In some ways, behavioral health is a bit behind the eight ball in terms of not having necessarily standardized clinical assessment procedures and tools. Um, psychosocial interventions aren't well characterized in CPT and other uh, types of taxonomies. And uh, with their exclusion from um, the High Tech Act, um, many behavioral health settings simply don't have access um, to um, adequate and inter interoperable behavioral health uh, components. Um, the next step, once you've standardized practice elements, how do you assemble that into recommended guidelines? Um, and while guidelines often exist in many of these uh, instances, um, they tend to be kind of general. And there's often a gaps in evidence that underlie the guidelines. And then even if you have good guidelines, the next step is to how do you translate those guidelines into measures that require the operationalization of measurement concepts into specific uh, um, data points that can create a, a, a systematic, reliable numerator and denominator. And then there's the issue of once you have the measures, um, how do you actually apply them to improve performance, either through quality improvement or through different ways of rewarding people in an accountable way. And ultimately, we want to develop this process in a way that um, adds to the evidence base and that we learn as we go along. It's kind of, it's kind of a learning health system. Um, and so getting measures put into play at a health policy level requires an understanding of the quality measurement industrial complex. And so if you think about it, there's different players in this game. Um, there are evidence developers, which are largely researchers, uh, you know, funded by, often by NIH, PCORI, AHRQ, um, that are developing the evidence that underlie what constitutes appropriate care. Um, and then professional associations and other groups um, take that evidence, systematically um, put that together to try to put that together to try to uh, um, develop uh, guidelines that are primarily developed by professional associations. Um, and then there are measure developers that take the evidence as, uh, as combined into guidelines um, that steward and develop measures uh, for use at a, at a policy level. And this includes uh, groups like the National Committee on Quality Assurance, the Joint Commission, CMS, often through contractors or researchers or sometimes professional associations. Um, and then once measures are developed, um, there's an expectation that they'll go through some sort of quality process of evaluation that's often conducted by the National Quality Forum, um, as well as through a separate process under the Affordable Care Act of the Measure Applications Partnership. And then once endorsed, um, there's sort of a good housekeeping seal of approval for their use by CMS, by health plans, by the states, by provider organizations, and by um, the public. Um, it's important to think about having a balanced portfolio of me measures. So we've, you know, we've talked about structural measures that actually create the capacity to provide evidence-based care. Um, and importantly, structures that support the use and reporting of outcomes. Um, different types of structural programs include those that have been developed as recognition programs by the Joint Commission. Um, uh, by patient center, such as patient center medical homes as developed by the National Committee on Quality Assurance. Um, the recent um, Protecting Access to Medicare Act included a section for a state demonstration program for certified community behavioral health centers, which is kind of a, a structural program um, in this area, as well as um, grant-funded programs that, uh, such as the uh, Primary Behavioral Health Care Integration Program funded by SAMHSA. Um, um, but there are process measures, too, which are looking at are not just do you have the capacity to provide evidence-based care, but are you actually develop, develop, delivering evidence-based care? Uh, and um, 
and these will often look at underuse, overuse, appropriateness, and the fidelity to which um, the care that's being provided represents the actual evidence base. Um, outcome measures actually look as the people actually get better. Um, each of these has different types of pros and cons, um, and uh, two subcomponents of outcomes are patient experience and resource use, which are basically subsets of outcomes. And each one of these has its uh, pros and cons. I mean, structure provides capacity, but it doesn't demonstrate that you're actually doing it. Um, process measures um, are assumptions that the process will link to outcomes, but it requires evidence that, in fact, they are linked to outcomes. And oftentimes, recent evidence doesn't necessarily demonstrate that. Um, people strive to have outcome measures, but one of the problems with outcome measures is that um, you need to have adequate risk adjustment. For them, and it also comes up in the process measures as well. Um, one of the things that's been raised about some of the issues, such as uh, applying the collaborative care model or other measures or other structural components, is that it requires a fairly substantial infrastructure to do that, and many small to medium-sized primary care practices just don't have that capacity. Um, and I would refer you to a uh, a report that by the United Hospital Fund um, that uh, Henry Chung and I uh, and others put together that developed a kind of a longitudinal framework for thinking about um, what are the key principles in uh, developing a structure that supports integrated care and how can different practices move along a kind of continuum to do that. And so these so basic principles are to have, number one, case finding, screening, and, and adequate grease referral to care. Number two, making sure that there's a multidisciplinary team that's systematically um, following patients uh, over time um, that has this multidisciplinary component of uh, including care managers, specialists, and primary care providers um, to make sure that there's a ongoing coordination, communication, and systematic longitudinal assessment um, that involves um, action-oriented decision support. Um, and the use of sy systematic quality improvement um, at a programmatic level and the use of quality measures for program improvement. Um, I mentioned decision support so that we're having a sort of measurement-based step care, much in the way I described before, for um, thinking of these uh, conditions as being chronic conditions that apply similar types of measurement-based strategies as you would in diabetes or uh, depression. Um, utilizing self-management uh, support, um, have registries that support tracking and coordination, and importantly, because of uh, the significant issues around social determinants and the inadequate access to community and social service, services to make sure that there's linkages to housing, entitlement, and other social support services. And this can be put in this context of a kind of a continuum, and this is only a, an excerpt from the overall framework, but um, that, that's accessible and we can send that around uh, if needed. Um, um, sixth point is measurement-based care. And just to get back to that point, um, what we're talking about here is the fact that for many types of these conditions, um, rather than treating them as a, as a longitudinal chronic condition, they actually are wind up being treated in a cross-sectional kind of way as a one-shot deal. Um, and so the trick is to actually systematically apply appropriate clinical measures um, and kind of have a measurement toolkit that allows you to actually choose among that and kind of armamentarium of assessment tools that can help you assess um, improvement over time. Number two, to assure uh, consistent and longitudinal follow-up, what we term ruthless follow-up, that allows people to not fall through the cracks. Um, and then if people aren't getting better, to use an action-oriented menu of evidence-based options of treat for treatment intensification and what people term step care. Um, and to establish this practice-based infrastructure that um, has a capacity to track people and provide data about outcomes um, and to build this kind of connectivity among different systems um, and develop incentive structures that produce these outcomes. Number six is realizing that we have to have shared accountability. And that's one of the problems is, you know, everybody can be pointing at each other in terms of who's the, at fault and instead, you have to really focus on the fact that everybody has a role in this. Um, 
it applies to all the participants caring for a patient. So if I'm a psychiatrist caring for a patient with schizophrenia and diabetes, I'm accountable for the outcomes, not just for schizophrenia, but also for diabetes. And my um, colleague, who's the primary care provider or diabetologist treating the patient for their diabetes, is equally responsible for both outcomes for schizophrenia and for diabetes. And all of this means that we have to talk to each other um, and collaborate uh, in the care of this patient. Um, the other thing that's come out, and this is something that's come up in the context of the Commonwealth Fund study, is to think of serious mental illness as a disparities category. Um, because of the high level of, gen of general medical comorbidity, and as I mentioned before, the lack of access to primary and preventive care, poor quality of care, and reduced lifespan, um, this is a group of people who, have, who are at great risk. And actually, there's some fairly low-hanging fruit um, to be able to implement measurement strategies. Um, one could report existing endorsed measures for this population segment um, and, by, uh, and, can, and compare that to the overall performance for the population as a whole. So thinking of, for example, uh, oftentimes uh, rel relatively easy, easily captured data about preventive health interventions, screening, immunizations can be captured and look at that as a disparities population or when there's comorbidity for common uh, common general medical comorbidities, uh, including diabetes and hypertension and cardiovascular disease, um, and screening and uh, and treatment for um, for smoking and uh, tobacco, there are ways to look at the extent to which these people are being treated in comparison to how over the overall population is, is treated. And we can include this kind of disparity in national disparities reports, and also at a state level. Um, the other thing is to realize some of the barriers to measurement in this field. Um, one is some of the limitations of the evidence base. Um, also, they need to get some agreement if you're going to apply measurement-based care on what the measures are. Um, and then codifying some of the things, some of the interventions that are not well codified, um, such as psychotherapy of different types for which you can't really pull out what is inside this black box of 90806 or 45 minutes of individual psychotherapy. Um, some of the issues cut across not just this area, but you know, the adequacy of the data sources, whether we're um, looking at documentation or reality, the difficulties in determining uh, benchmarks and risk adjustment, and you know, as I mentioned before, some of the linkages between structure, process, and outcome. Um, and also some of the limitations we have in the, in, the, in, the, in the structure of how we are developing measures, because certainly for behavioral health care, there is no um, entity, certainly in the government, that is responsible for stewarding the field and funding measure development. Um, and also some of the limitations uh, in terms of the exclusion from the High Tech Act for um, non-physicians and for behavioral health clinics, um, the heterogeneity of pro uh, providers in the behavioral health space, and again, the need to establish this kind of uh, shared accountability. And finally, just to say a word about the, the Commonwealth Fund project of creating a, a measurement agenda, we've been doing reviews of different potential uh, categories of measures, both in terms of process, structure, access, outcomes and patient perceptions, and cost and efficiency. We've also conducted an expert Delphi process um, to help identify what are priorities or the next steps. Um, and then we intend, once this is finally developed, to actually engage different members of the quality measurement industrial complex to actually um, market and further develop um, some of these measures that are available. Just to say a few words about the measure, uh, about the Delphi study that we just conducted, um, we actually had 24 people that are experts in different areas that cut across um, state Medicaid officials, uh, behavioral health providers, general health providers, people involved in health plans, consumers, um, people involved in regulatory groups. We had two rounds of the Delphi panel study, including a second round that involved um, you know, a face-to-face -face meeting. And um, just to, uh, these are the sort of categories or domains of measures that we looked at, uh, you know, across the different uh, possibilities based upon a review where we identified over 600 measures that are potentially applicable. Um, and um, as we've gone through that, we had everybody rate these measures, measure concepts on importance, validity, and feasibility. And we've sort of come up with a kind of an algorithm for thinking about um, 
what measures are worthy of further development and what role could there be. And so I'm not going to go through this in detail, but that we will be coming out with a, an agenda that um, applies some of this thinking um, going forward. So perhaps I'll stop there and we can move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Pincus. At this time, I would like to invite Greg uh, to start his presentation. Thank you very much. And um, I actually wish that I was able to listen to Dr. Pincus um, a year and a half ago before we started the adventure we're about to describe because now I get to feel guilty about things that we, uh, we, we could have uh, considered more uh, thoughtfully here on our rocket ship ride to try to integrate physical and behavioral health medicine and, and behavioral health and try to measure that as best we can. So the first part of this, I'm really going to talk a little bit about um, the structure that we've put in place just to do a quick, very quick, with apologies, level set, and then I'll dive into what we're measuring and some of the very early uh, results. So many of you may know in New York we've been uh, launching a, a set of initiatives and in Medicaid redesign is MRT, DISHRP is our is our federal uh, delivery system reform incentive payment waiver, and then we've been, as part of that waiver, working on value-based payment, or, or VBP. The 1115 waiver that we have, and we got about $8 billion of, of um, reinvested savings from previous Medicaid redesign initiatives that save federal dollars, and we've put um, actually additional resources on top of this on the state side, both in capital, but we got about Six and a half billion that are going out on a performance basis in the beginning process and the end outcome, dedicated to do delivery system change. Um, you know, toward toward the triple aim. A lot of this in projects that are being run by um, these local performing provider systems. Our centralized goal here for the Medicaid waiver was to reduce um, avoidable hospital use, including both. Um, uh, ED and inpatient care by 25% over the next five years. And a big um, important part of that was a set of projects to integrate <clears throat> behavioral health and primary care. And if I lose my voice because I've been doing like being webinar boy today, so I apologize. Um, but the, the measurement of behavioral health and primary care was not just important for this state's waiver where we were actually doing pay for performance, but it is also important to the value-based payment that's required as part of the waiver um, as, as well. So measurement of behavioral health, as difficult as it is for all the reasons that Dr. Pincus was describing, is sort of critical to this. Inside of our waiver, we're required to move all of our managed care payments um, beyond fee-for-service to some form of fee-for-value. Um, and 80 or 90 percent of those downstream payments have to be on some kind of pay-for-value uh, schema by uh, 2020. So, um, you know, the idea here is we'd stop paying for uh, codable widgets and paying for visits and um, inpatient days and instead begin to purchase health and behavioral health care. Uh, and that is, you know, a challenging endeavor, but if we're going to reduce avoidable hospitalization in the state, we have to tackle the behavioral health agenda um, head on. So there's a series of ways that we allow um, our plans to contract on a value basis. Level one is just a fee-for-service payment with upside shared savings as long as there's a minimum level of outcome and efficiency that's achieved and there's no real risk built baked into that. Level three is more of a prospective capitation with upside and downside risk. And level two is somewhat straddling the two where you're still getting paid on a fee-for-service but you um, have a little bit more um, downside uh, in, 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 the, in the game than in level one, but less downside risk than in level three. So providers are beginning to work with plans on constructing these value-based payment contracts, and many of them are, of course, confounded by how to measure quality for um, integrated behavioral health and primary care uh, and also for the very specialized set of services we're setting up for our folks with serious mental illness, um, persistent mental illness, and serious substance use disorder. So our structure is that a lot of our activity runs through the MCO, and I have the MCO roles listed here, but we've set up um, through our district program these 25 performing provider systems, 
and think of them as um, service integration and quality improvement engines to help the local service delivery system to improve. And on the value-based payment side, <clears throat> the plan will be contracting with these um, mostly independent practice associations who are value-based contractors, very often now assisted by the PPS and the performance measurement, and some of this is just starting to come together. But underneath that, down in the service delivery system, we build this HARPER, the Health and Recovery Plan, which is a product line off of our mainstream managed care. And this is for people with bipolar, schizophrenia, serious substance use disorder, and uh, with functional deficits. And we have to, we've had to like develop a more robust set of performance measures for that population in particular if we were going to contract um, under a value basis for those services as part of a subpopulation in the overall book of business. And then also as respects to behavioral health, on the advanced and integrated behavioral health and primary care, we have to figure out how to integrate more um, behavioral health appropriate measures without sort of getting this measure tipping point where the primary care practices just can't pay attention anymore. And we have health home in the ecosystem as well to help us um, do more uh, hands-on care management of people with multiple chronic illnesses. So on the um, behavioral health and VVP side, we started this fairly robust process of bringing clinical advisors in to help us select the measures that would be used for each of the subpopulations and the episodes. So on the behavioral health side, we set up a behavioral health um, clinical advisory group um, include uh, folks from academia, folks from practice, um, et cetera. And um, actually, the, the, the groups are on, on the next slide here. So we have a broadly represented um, group of folks. Our state agencies are partners in the Office of Mental Health and the Office uh, of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse uh, Services were on these as well, as well as the health plan and the, um, the provider uh, specialty groups. And what they did is they helped us to look at measure alignment, but also on the behavioral health side to really try to push the process, as Dr. Pincus was mentioned, to try to advance measures even where there was not, um, and I, I love the, uh, the, the uh, measure industrial complex, where there's not a fully vetted out measure that had made its way all the way through that, that, that industrial complex. We want to begin to test measures even on a pay for reporting basis. So we have this process in place, and because behavioral health is so tricky, most of the CAGs like cardiac and maternity, et cetera, they, they met and they um, made the recommendation and they, and they went away. The behavioral health um, clinical advisory group is going to stay with us um, to do an annual review, but also to measure the process of implementing these measures as well as just putting the measures together. And we're putting these value-based payment pilots together to actually test the feasibility of, and the relevance of some of the measures. So um, <clears throat> prior to us um, putting a measure out across the entire system and then finding out, oh, we did pay for performance on a measure that just wasn't um, reliable, um, we have the pilots to allow us to test these measures in real, in real practice. So um, th th this um, clinical advisory group job here in our state was really important, and especially on the behavioral health side where so many of the measures were not mature, and we needed to measure processes that we were putting in place for our HARP on things like the percentage of the home and community-based services that were coming up across the, across the community. And I really love Dr. Pincus's um, categorization of the measures and looking at that structural component um, is really useful because we're, we're looking at capacity development as well as ongoing outcome, recognizing we may not have the perfect outcome connectivity to some of these structures and processes that we're putting in place. Um, but we, we have, ha we did a separate um, uh, CAG for the behavioral health side and for, the, for this very particular focus on the HARP as well. This is our HARP definition, and again, these are people with um, serious diagnoses who also have um, undergone a home and community-based eligibility assessment to be assured that they have functional deficits in addition to a clinically identifiable diagnosis like um, schizophrenia. And there's various levels of defined services, so we had to map our measures to those services as well. And so just for fun, I'm, I'm showing you the, the measures that we've picked. And 
that we put these measures into category one, and these were the ones that we thought were um, already had some reliability. We had they're feasible because we had a reporting source, and the ones that we thought were um, the most uh, connected with outcome, the most feasible, the most reliable. We put them in category one, but we would also um, do uh, pay for performance. So any measure here that has a one is a is a high value measure to the state that we are requiring the plans to use in their contracts. And if it says no in this P for R, it means that that's a pay for performance measure that we are actively going to change dollars in the quality equation based on that measure. If there's a yes in the P for R column, it means this is an important thing to us but we want to do pay for reporting for a while to make sure we can stabilize this, understand differences, make sure we're risk adjusting properly prior to uh, changing it to uh, pay for performance. And you can see um, we are beginning to experiment with some pay for reporting on category one measures for, um, for addiction as well as in substance use disorders as well as the more uh, robust and, and, and more developed um, mental health measures. In, in addition to the usual measures on follow-up and, um, and, and uh, med adherence, et cetera, that are a little bit more uh, validated out there and have been part of uh, some of them, uh, HEDIS and our, our in-state core program as, as well in the quality incentive for our managed care plans. The other you know, conversation that we're getting into now, especially that we're looking at some of the measures that you see on, on, on this list that are in category two, that the, the clinical advisory group said, you know, there's issues, these might be good measures, but there are issues with them. We've promoted some of them and we we into category one to say, you know what, we think these are really important, so we're gonna look at some of these home and community-based services and this, um, uh, you know, the, the recovery-oriented approach kinds of services, we want to look at volume measures on those, and we're going to do pay for reporting on those for a while. Some of these other measures that were historically in Category 2 that we promoted to Category 1, though, we are actually going to do pay for reporting on. Um, and this will be, you know, important to watch how some of this goes because we get into conversations about what's the right power numerator denominator on some of these to be able to, you know, to make this work. So. Uh, also, we get into questions about which of these measures are uh, good for measuring overall health plan performance versus measuring, say, a value-based payment contractor versus measuring an individual practice. And uh, that, those questions are, you know, still ongoing as we're working with our health plans and medical directors and their quality teams. But we really want to align the measures that we're holding our health plans accountable with to the full extent possible with the measures that we would ask them to be holding um, the downstream providers associated with. And I didn't put up, you know, the, the longer set of measures for measuring integrated primary care and behavioral health, but those are available on our website as well as focusing on these HARP measures that um, are kind of interesting because one of the things that's really a challenge, and it came up in Dr. Pincus's talk, is you know measuring uh, recovery um, is very different than measuring hemoglobin A1C, and and the and the and the, and the progression of measure sets around that is really difficult. And yet we really do want to do pay for value in some of this home and community-based work. So uh, we are pushing the envelope a little bit here on the measurement side. We recognize it. We are hoping that the value-based um, uh, payment pilots will give us a little bit more insight in, in the usability of some of these measures. Um, There's just a little bit of, of background data here, you know, just to why this is important, and many of you, you know, have this in, in, in your states as well in the same way. You know, our members with behavioral health are about a fifth of the population. They're about a third of the primary care visits, a little less than half of the ED visits. They're over 50% of our admissions and 60% of our total cost of care. So if we move to a pay for value equation and don't have the right kinds of measures for this population, um, and, and, and part of our measurement also is looking at efficiency and looking at total um, avoidable cost, potentially avoidable cost, and lots of the potentially avoidable cost is stacking up in physical health care conditions underneath this population. And this is evidenced here, you know, our, our, a couple of years ago, our all-in readmissions cost in New York Medicaid was $814 million. 
82% of that cost was for people that had mental health and substance abuse. But when you broke apart that 82% or that $665 million, 60% of that was a medical readmission for a person with mental health or substance abuse complicating their scenario. So braiding together the behavioral health measures with the physical health care measures is so important because much of what we're seeing on avoidable costs is medical in nature, but with a behavioral health or substance use disorder as the underlying condition that's undertreated um, and getting in the way of proper you know, primary care, proper um, pharmacy management, et cetera. So we've been moving as part of DISHRP and VBP to do more service integration, and we are actually arraying our measures in, in, in uh, the federal DISHRP-like fashion across domains two, three, and four, which are really the systems transformation, the clinical transformation in domain three, and then casting that broader net where the denominator is the entire population, not just the Medicaid insured. And we are looking at performance improvement in all three of those areas. Um, and we have projects in DISHRIP um, that have a behavioral health flavor, and we got a lot of money in our DISHRIP program tied into these behavioral health measures. And again, I think the measure sets are important, but we have really promoted an importance in the performance measurement program in the waiver that you can't get your district money if you don't work really hard on behavioral health. And the only project that all 25 of our PPS uh, picked was this Project 3AI, which is integrating primary care and behavioral health. And that project carries with it a lot of um, dollars and a lot of dollars tied to behavioral health and primary care integration type um, measures. And here, I'm just previewing, and this is measurement year one when most of our PPSs were still in the very formative stages, but you'll see um, these are a, a, a subset of measures. If it says HP next to it, it's a high performance measure. We can talk about that in a little bit later. But we pay, in, starting in measurement year two for some of these, we pay on gap to goal if, a, if, a, if an individual PPS closes their gap to goal by 10%. And for some of these, these PPSs were already achieving their measurement target before we converted to P for P. But you see the year on the right-hand column that some of these are converting to um, pay for performance, and we're in the middle of um, reporting out on data right now <clears throat> that's going to drive dollars for some of these. But if you look down here, potentially preventable emergency room visits for the behavioral health subpopulation, um, only two of our PPSs were doing real well on that measure, so many of them implementing projects to try to affect that. And, and what we're, we're also showing them over here on this next slide is we show each PPS their relative movement. In this chart, we're looking at that one that they're not doing so well on, the potentially preventable emergency room visits for behavioral health. The little light purple is where they started in measurement year zero. The dark purple is measurement year one. So we track them, and we're actually giving the PPS rolling monthly updates on this data as it's coming in live into the Medicaid claim system so they can see how they're doing and actually drill it to um, registry type lists. We put a lot of money into this high performance fund. So PPSs that close their gap to goal by 20% instead of 10%. So back here, we have a statewide performance goal and in each year they have to close the distance between their um, in-year bubble and that line by 10%. And if they do that, they get a regular performance payment. If they close it by 20%, and it's one of the measures in this list here, they get extra dollars in this fund. And actually, dollars that are surrendered from the regular performance get deposited in the high performance. And you see everything with a little BH on it is at least in an ancillary way a behavioral health measure. So most of the measures in our high performance fund in our district program are behavioral health oriented. Um, <clears throat> and even not sure why we don't have a BH uh, next to the antipsychotic use in persons with uh, dementia, but uh, I think it's like floating down here or something. So we put a lot of, a lot of um, uh, stake out there on, on behavioral health measures, and we're also trying to progress the measure set to something that's a little bit more robust to support our HARP efforts and our VBP efforts. And with that, I really appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. And at this point, I will open up Q&A. Uh, we have received a few questions in the chat box so far, but please continue to add them. Um, we have about eight minutes left for Q&A. 
Um, so we did receive a couple uh, questions around endorsement and validation of measures. I'm curious to hear from both of you in terms of um, does NQF uh, has NQ, just the the level of endorsement around measures that get to integration and value based purchasing? Um, so, Greg, in your experience, when uh, the PPSs and the measurement was being developed for them, um, was NQF or alignment with CMS measures adequate? And, and um, Dr. Pincus, in in your work, um, I'd love to hear more on on what you found in your research. Well, on our side, and I, again, Dr. Pickus is probably much more of an expert on this on the measurement side than, than I am, but my, our generalized observation in, in, the, in the frustration of the field is a lot of the validated measures are measures of um, medically oriented kinds of things um, or uh, things around speed from inpatient to ambulatory connectivity. And the, you know, the recovery advocates who are really um, you know, it's less interested in if a patient's taken their medicine and whether or not they were, you know, had a warm handoff between inpatient and outpatient, but more interested in are they employed, um, are they happy, uh, do they uh, more, or can they more meaningfully um, participate in, in, uh, in life. Those kinds of measures, uh, particular to the kinds of services that we're trying to offer through the HARP, are just not on any of those validated lists, and that's why I think that some of the efforts that Dr. Pincus was describing are so critical, you know, this game. We're trying not to attach money to non-validated things, but the truth is um, a lot of what matters in this game is not yet validated, and I, I, and I, 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 I might, might be corrected by Dr. Pincus on that point, but that at least is my observation here. So uh, just a couple of things. So that a relatively small report, the, the NQF has an endorsement process. It's important to distinguish between endorsement and validation and also use of measures. So CMS will use measures in many of its programs. They don't have to be endorsed by NQF, but you know, the vast majority of them are and uh, you know, when they're you know when they're reviewed by by NQF. Um, importantly Validation is a different issue than endorsement um, because, you know, in many cases there is a lot of question about what do you mean by validation and, uh, you know, what's the level of evidence. Um, basically, NQF has uh, sort of two lines of business. One is a, what's, uh, as a multi-stakeholder group, non-governmental, they go through a process of reviewing measures and have very explicit criteria that get applied through a consensus development process that includes experts in different areas and then goes through various stages of NQF review for endorsement. It doesn't necessarily mean they're validated. Um, you know, they find sometimes that after they're put in place that, you know, problems crop up. Um, and then it becomes sort of a list where people can, you know, sort of a menu that um, users, users of quality measures can choose from. To, um, as they apply to their particular, uh, um, as they apply to their particular programs that they're implementing. In general, in terms of behavioral health per se, it's a relatively small proportion of the overall list of NQF member, measures. I think if they have something around 750 measures, and there's something like you know 35 that are sort of behavioral health endorsed measures. Um, and there's actually right now. Um, uh, a, a call for measures out there for behavioral health measures, and there's a, a meeting I think planned in February um, for the by the behavioral health standing committee of NQF. I actually co-chair that committee. Great, thank you. And we, we did receive a couple questions about the Delphi study that you mentioned in your presentation. So I'm curious if we could answer those in terms of when will the results be released, as well as um, could you just briefly review the measure domains and how they were chosen? So I mean, you can go back to slide. So I guess it was slide uh, 26. Uh, oh, sorry, this one. Yeah, and so these are the uh, sort of the domains, um, and we um, developed this off of basically we did a large review of existing quality measures from all kinds of different sources, and then we um, put them, we, we categorized them in terms of their measure as measure concepts, because sometimes you may have like five or six measures, for example measuring follow-up after hospitalization because they have different specifications and they use for different purposes. But, you know, we combine it into a concept of follow-up after hospitalization. 
um, and then we categorize them um, based upon whether um, they were really uh, largely applied in general medical care settings to measure um, integration in some way or whether they're uh, applied it mostly in behavioral health care settings um, or whether they are really apply to both. Um, and then we also had one sort of cross-cutting thing around this whole concept of stratification um, and disparities. Um, and so that's how we, how we organized it. Um, in terms of, uh, well, so we, we have a, you know, a close to final draft of a paper on the Delphi panel that we're going to be submitting very soon. We're also working on a sort of an issue brief and report for the Commonwealth Fund. So hopefully those will be available, um, you know, sometime early next year. Great, thank you. And we are nearing the top of the hour, but we do just have a couple questions left uh, regarding New York's program. So, uh, Greg, I'm curious if you could speak real quickly about um, timely notification of discharge between mental health facilities and physical health facilities, and um, that was identified as a barrier uh, from one of our participants in, in their state. And did you look at, um, did you experience that issue when looking at quality measures in the HARP arrangement? And if so, how did you deal with it? Sorry, Greg, not sure if you're on mute. Yeah, I gave a great answer on mute. Sorry. <laughs> um, there's, the, there's the clinical side of that. We're working on a mer uh, admission discharge trans transfer side. We struggle a little bit more on the state hospital side. The rest of it, we've got you know Medicaid claims to trigger the discharge for the measurement purpose of that. Um, but I'd be happy to talk to the qu questioner a little bit more about you know some of the more operational side of that. Measurement with claims data in terms of discharge and then a, uh, arrangement with ambulatory, we, we, we can do that. We can do that relatively cleanly, but we do have the state hospital challenge, which is not part of our claim structure. And then could you also just briefly speak to um, the state's efforts in terms of practice transformation and quality improvement and whether there were trainings or tools that are available and maybe resources available on the state's website that other states could adopt to help them through this? Yeah, so we've used some of the, um, the, the PPSs are doing a, a, a lot of practice support around DISHRIP and those utilize DISHRIP funds. And then as part of the uh, state's health improvement and our SIM grant, we have some practice transformation money for the primary care practices around getting to advanced levels of practice, including integrating primary care and behavioral health. But there's more need than we have capacity right now, that's for sure. Well, with that, I think we have reached the top of the hour. I um, just can't thank everybody enough for all of their time today, uh, both the speakers as well as the attendees. Um, on the slide here, which will be available on our website in the next few days, we have included some links to some additional resources, um, all of which uh, Dr. Pincus was a co-author on, um, including the United Hospital Fund report that he mentioned earlier, as well as uh, three publications that um, are summarized on the Commonwealth Fund. The full articles are available through uh, these publications. Applications. Um, if you have any questions about this webinar, uh, please do not hesitate to get in contact with me. Uh, my email is ctownley, T-O-W-N-L-E-Y, at nashby, N-A-S-H-B, dot org. And again, thank you all, and we look forward to the next event. Thank you.